If you want to see more videos and interviews like this from influential people in tech, finance, and sports, subscribe to the channel and make sure you hit the bell to be alerted. And go a step further and join the YouTube and membership area for early releases of videos like this. I'm out of here. Ha! Yes, your boy Crypto Blood, and welcome to another kicking in session today. I've got Raul Winkling. I'm going to talk to him about something he's doing here in my city, the Coleman Young Educational Fund. I want to talk to him about STEM and trying to get minorities into the tech realm, much needed, and also about entrepreneurship. I was actually on their show, uh, their podcast, Cryptology, uh, uh, maybe about a year ago now. So uh, glad to have him on. What's going on, Ro? Not a lot, man. Just looking to, uh, you know, talk to the people, have a conversation with you about, you know, what we're doing and obviously what you're doing and discuss, you know, things that are particularly important in this time when we talk about, you know, the economy, we talk about entrepreneurship and the ability for us to not just work, but for us to provide jobs and opportunity for one another internally in the community. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree, man. And uh, yeah. before we start, wh mm -hmm. why the song Nipsey Hustle Perfect Timing? I love that track. Um, that that song, um, because, you know, we, we get so, you know, when we're young, right, they tell you, hey, go to school, do this. And, you know, if you don't do it at this time, then it's not going to ever happen for you. And the reality is that song talks about, you know, everyone runs their own race. Um, so I'm not running my race in 30 years it might take you 20 it might take the next man 60 but the truth is each race is individual and whenever it happens for you whatever it is that's the point of, of that song that's the perfect timing for you it's just an individual thing you know there's no one size fits all yeah man that's a good point because yeah. in today's age with social mm -hmm. media you know you i think people i think you know depression and stuff is probably at an all-time high because oh, people oh, are for sure. people are are comparing their lives to what perfect life other people are portraying on youtube or on instagram or twitter mm -hmm. or whatever and they mm -hmm. don't understand they go through stuff and have failures every day just like everyone else you know well you just you know when you talk about social media you're talking about a curated version of your life right you know? um you know, I could get on here today at, you know, 11, 11 a.m. on the 28th of May and, and you know, show you a stack of a million dollars, right? Right. But you, you don't know how long it took me to get that. You don't know what's going to happen with that stack. You know, at 11.15, I might have to give that stack of money back to some <laughs> other person who it belongs to, you know, or or I might, I might you know get into a situation where that stack is no longer a million and now it's five hundred thousand, right? So you're 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 capturing a perfect moment, uh curated to get the maximum amount of wow, right? But what does that really say? Is that's just one moment in, in the life of somebody, whether they be twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, sixty, you know, and the ability to have more of those moments I think is what drives a lot of people. You know, everybody wants to have those what I call presentable moments on social media. And rather than doing that, I think you should focus on presentable moments for you and your family and whatever those mean. And it, you know, again, there's no one size fits all. You know, I might perfectly be happy with a, you know, a twenty dollar steak, right? And you might only want to eat a hundred dollar steak. And mm -hmm. and I shouldn't compare myself to you because, you know, hey. I'm eating just like you, right? And and we get into these comparisons and these competitions and the reality is uh, we should be competing with ourselves. And again, you know, I'm saying this stuff obviously now, but you know, I wasn't always thinking that way. But the reason right. I think we have these conversations is to encourage young people and, you know, for me specifically, man, to really encourage young black people and, and, and to really think, um, to really develop their own way of thinking and their own version of what success is and, and it's so tough because you have this constant barrage of, of, of input telling you what perfect is and you know it, it, it's tough you know I, I certainly understand the challenge that they face in terms of forging their own path but I think a big deal um, should be made about how uh, lessening um, your interactions on, on, on the internet um, right. should be a focus um, sorry, I didn't say that right. We should focus on on not 
focusing on the internet as much. That's what yes. I should say. Yes, I, um, I agree. And, and yeah. what you're doing here in the city mm-hmm. uh, yeah. with the Coleman Young Educational Fund is, is just mm-hmm. that. You know, education yeah. is not sexy. Uh, you know, going into STEM is not sexy. Mm-hmm. It's not right. flashy. It it's not. Be. It should be. It you know? should because be, but it, it is not it, on. Right? Yeah, but it's, it's not on you know, our radar. No, it's not, not on, on our radar. radar. Not on our yeah. radar. And and it's so crazy because if you look at the the diesel penetration rate, um, you know, I think we're up there. Um, I have to look at the data, but I believe that 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 we are avid users of social media. Mm-hmm. Um, we are avid consumers of technology, and I think. You know, our goal of the foundation is to to not stop our students from being consumed, but engaging them and encouraging them and guiding them to become more producers of technology, to become creators of technology, to become owners of technology, right? And and that's not to say that, you know, currently we have about 70 students enrolled. That's not to say that 70 students are going to become 70 owners of companies like Google, right? But that should be the goal because if that's the goal, then the accomplishments are going to be there. That means you're going to, first of all, you're going to have skills that are marketable and that can help you globally, right? You can literally take those skills and move anywhere in the world and find yourself in a position to take care of yourself and your family. So that's one. Secondly, it allows you to become valuable. I think right now, um, people aren't really thinking about what value we bring. We bring a very limited value. And, and, and I know that's going to anger some people, but I really don't care. If you look at the that's realistic, the truth. We, br- we, bring a, we bring a very limited value. You know, we really aren't that important in the grand scheme. And I think that once you realize that you start to think of ways to position yourself to become more important, to become more vital, and not to the outside world, but just internally in the community, right? How do we get kids to... Um, to, first of all, gain the skill set that's going to get them future ready, as we say at the foundation. And what is future ready, right? Having technical skills, having engineering skills, having math skills, right? Having science skills. Because again, once you have those skills, you can literally do anything. You know, now during this pandemic, right? Obviously, all of us, myself included, even though I said we should focus on not spending as much time on the internet, we have no choice because we're all in the house, right? Mm-hmm. So you're in the house, you're just susceptible to more in- to more content that's out there right and now if you're if you're a person that's that's you know has a certain mind mindset you're looking for content that you can learn from or that is at least informative or that gives you some type of insight into something right and you know what i've been seeing i've been seeing a number of entrepreneurs who are um using their former skills in stem to run businesses that are not so that that on the outside don't seem like stem at all Mm. um there's a guy there's a guy that i follow has one of the best coffee shops in Los Angeles and that guy was a former um I believe biotechnical engineer you know um even even us you know we have a uh, a coffee shop here that we run along with my brand partners who have a juice brand called Jinjin you know one of our partners he's an engineer actually graduated from Michigan State so when you have that background you're unlimited in what you can do you don't have to be an engineer but it gets you into a situation where that skill set is so adaptable and transferable across a number of sectors that you always create opportunity for yourself. And that's really the one thing that you want to have, man. You never want to be a one trick pony. You know, let's, let's put it into sports, right? We all love basketball. You know I mean? That, that's not a stereotype. That's just a fact, you know, and that's, that's white, black, whatever, right? It's, the, mm-hmm. it's one of the most popular sports in the world. Well, guess what? If all you have is a jumper, you're not going to last long. It's just what it is. Right. All you can do is dribble. You're not going to last long. You have to be versatile. You have to be multifaceted. Or if you have one skill, you better be among the best of the world in it, right? And even then, you're not going to really last as long as the guy that's multifaceted. You know, you're, you're again, you know, you, you want to give yourself as many chances to win as possible. And you do that by being um, as skilled as possible. Right? And that's what we try to encourage our kids to do. Yeah, no, that makes sense, man. Um, and, you know, I, I'm I'm interested in knowing exactly mm-hmm. how you even clicked up with the Coleman Young uh, Foundation. What was that? How did that okay. all come about? I know you you so, have some connections to the city. Uh, right. Kind of give us a little background on how you you know did that. Okay. So um, my um, good friend of mine um, actually moved to Detroit um, a few years back, 
Uh, he has a real estate company out there. So that's one of my connections to the city. The other connection to the city is uh, the executive director of the foundation um, was filming a documentary in Detroit. Uh, Curtis Schoon, the executive director of the foundation, was filming a documentary out in Detroit. And he um, ended up conversing with Coleman A. Young, who's the son, obviously, of the legendary Detroit mayor, Coleman Young. Mm -hmm. He ended up conversing with him. And at that time, Coleman Young, who is our CEO and founder, he was a state senator. And he was, I believe he was running for, he was running for mayor, then he ran for Congress. And him and him and Mr. Schoon ended up connecting uh, for the documentary called Black, uh, Black, White and Blue, which is a documentary that Mr. Schoon was shooting. And they ended up interviewing, he ended up interviewing Coleman A. Young. I really was impressed by him and his work in the city. And so they connected and became um, friends. And obviously um, I, um, came in and, and I was interested in what um, Mr. Young was doing because look, uh, there are not many cities where um, there's such a strong cultural um, influence that black people have like Detroit. You can argue that it's probably the most profound um, influence because of the fact that Motown and, and, and all of that, you know, you talk about Ethan Franklin, you talk about, um, you know, other great artists that came through that. That's just the fact, like I'm not making this up, you know, you, it's just what it is. It's historical. So that obviously was, was something that I was aware of. But then when I started looking into what was going on in the city, I also recognized the opportunity. Uh, not opportunity to necessarily make money. That's fine too, but opportunity to really affect change. Uh, the truth of the matter is if you're living in a bigger city like, say, New York or L.A. or even Atlanta or Miami, again, man, you know, people can get mad or whatever. You're not really moving to me. You know, mm -hmm. if, 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 if you're black, you, the likelihood of you moving the needle is low. And that's mm -hmm. not because you're not competent or not smart or intelligent, but just because you don't have the money and you don't have the numbers. Um, so I looked at Detroit and I said, you know, this is a large city, a major city, a uh, historical city with a, with a, you know, with a, with a, a track record of engineering and manufacturing. Um, you know, there's opportunity there. And so when, Mr. Young um, was running for office, uh, for, sorry, for Congress and for mayor. He didn't succeed, obviously, but we developed a rapport and I already had a rapport with Mr. Schoon. And so what happened was um, Mr. Young, he decided that, hey, you know, I'm done uh, in politics, but I obviously still want to give back to the city. And what has been my passion? My passion has been education. You know, he's a champion for education. The track record is there. You can look it up. And so we got together and said, hey, that's great. You know, obviously I went to a great school. I went to Columbia here in New York. Um, and I figured that, you know, the, the key in life is, man, you got to pay it forward. You know, I had that opportunity. Why would I want to stop that opportunity with me? I should be able to advise people and guide people and, and, and give information for them to be able to pursue the same thing that I received, right? Mm -hmm. So I brought, I, I bought into that vision of, that Mr. Young had and that Mr. School supported. And, you know, we got together and, and you know, I decided to, to help out and, and get involved because, again, you know, we keep having these conversations about, oh, you know, there's no black people here. There's no black people there. And I mean, OK, now what? Right. Right. OK, so who, who's going to do something? And, you know, that's what we're doing. You know, uh, we are self-financed at this point um, and we're raising funds. Um, you know, you can click on our website and you can donate. And we're in discussion with some some, you know, corporate partners as well as uh, federal and, and state partners on how we can bring more of uh, what we're doing to the public. You know, right now, obviously, COVID affected everything, right? Everyone's affected. That's why you and I are sitting in our respective homes and not being, uh, you know, outside enjoying the weather, whatever it may be. But um, we're still bringing our program to the, to the students. You know, we have a uh, Google Classroom. We have online resources. Um, actually, what we do on a weekly basis, we bring in people such as yourself um, to discuss, you know, how how they got into STEM or how they got into entrepreneurship or how they got into the legal uh, sector. And again, it's all about giving our kids a different mindset, you know, because again, when you look at social media, we've been bombarded with a specific type of, of activity. Mm -hmm. um, look, I love music as much as the next man. I love sports as much as the next man. But the truth is, man, the, the likelihood of you succeeding in any of those sectors is low. Yeah, you, you have you have a you have a better chance of becoming an actuary, an engineer, 
Mm -hmm. a computer science major, a biology student, a chemistry major, and, and not only having your education paid for, but again, gaining those skills that will allow you to make anywhere from 70 to 100,000 and more for 20 years, man. You know, we don't teach our kids about compounding. I really wasn't aware of it myself because again, it's not that we're dumb or that we're not smart. We just don't know a lot. Of yep. The information, the information just isn't shared with us and we don't share the information with each other. You know, if you make, if you make enough money, right? And you keep your overhead low, you're going to be rich, you know, it's just inevitable. Most of the people that we talk about that are wealthy, they're outliers. But when you talk about regular, when you talk about household wealth, among white Americans, black Americans, Asian Americans, Latino black Americans. Black Americans have, I think, a negative uh, right. <laughs> uh, right. network, right. man. But, right. No, absolutely. But if you think about all these groups that have this household wealth, they're not athletes. They're no. not entertainers. You know, it'll be a dentist or a guy who owns a, you know, who owns a liquor store or a guy who owns a grocery store or a woman who owns a flower shop or hey, a nine times out of ten or a doctor. But nine times out of yeah. ten, the the guy that owns the team was never a, a player himself, right? He, never, he didn't take that role. Never even played. Never even never played. played. Nate, listen, if anything, he probably was the team manager. Right. You know. Um. So so I want us to stop thinking about things in an entertainment way. Like we have to, we have, and, and I understand it because I've been there. You know, you're young, um, you're grown. You know, I came from humble beginnings. Um, my parents were far from rich. We weren't poor, but we were just average, man, you know, working mm -hmm. class. And I wanted stuff, you know? I wanted all the, you know, I wanted all the, the, the sneakers, the, the the Jordans, the AI, the coat. I wanted all of that. But, um, you know, how important is that in the grand scheme of things? You know, and, and, and I think what happens when you grow up a certain way, you, you seek status in the wrong thing. Because human nature is to seek status, you know. But what are you seeking status in? If you seek status in sneakers and jewelry and cars and women, that's not going to last. Um, trust me, it's not. Yeah. You ask anybody that that lives a little bit in their 30s, 40s, 50s, they'll tell you that they have some regrets, some things they wish they had done differently because most of us, I hate to say it, we're going to go the wrong route. Not necessarily criminal. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the wrong route and the things that we pursue. Uh, we're going to pursue things that are high risk, low reward. But in our mind, we're thinking it's a high reward. And it's not. Because there's one guy. There's a reason there's only one LeBron. You know, there's a reason there's only one Anthony Davis. There's a reason those there's only outliers. one, one blip. Yeah, those are outliers. You know? And we take that and yeah. try to ex and extrapolate you can do it across. It. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, no, I, I agree. Why do you think and, that... And, why do you yeah, think no. in our in our community we have uh, such a um, I don't know a bent toward uh, athlete you know the whole sports arena why why is that why don't we look to aspire to be like uh, Bob Johnson or Robert Smith or some of these individuals who were didn't go the the sports route why why yeah. is that because I think that route. Um has its own pitfalls that I think a lot of us aren't equipped to deal with. Gotcha. Um, you know, when you, when you, so I'll, I'll use myself as an example. Um, you know, I went to, I went to Columbia university here in the city and it's, you know, it's, it's a university with a tremendous pedigree. But what I realized when I got on that campus is how far, um, I'm not going to say behind, but how far removed I was from the level of, of, power and access that kind of is where people pick winners and losers mm -hmm. um you know we are we are so far removed from that man like you know again on average when you think of what we do as a community if we if we get a job right and 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 we stay in that job for 20 years that's a victory and and you know we also we also don't know about um, a lot of things that create wealth. I'll give you an example. On social media, I got into a, um, it's not an argument, but a discussion about um, people were people were talking about, you know, property ownership, right? And property ownership is great. But do you know that 
when you look at wealth, right? Um, white household wealth, because again, the reason we bring that up because that's that's the standard, right? Because we live in a society that where they have the numeric advantage, they have the wealth advantage. Um, the average white household's money, I'm sorry, the average white household wealth was tied up in real estate at a number that was applicable, like it was equal to other things. So they might have had, so let's say they have 100% of wealth. Um, they might, that wealth might be, you know, 20% tied up in real estate, the house that they live in, you know, 30%, um, equities or something like that. And then other investments, right? But with black people, most of our wealth was tied up into our house. Mm -hmm. So if the housing market goes sideways, you lose everything. Right. So again, and those people were smart. Those people yeah. worked hard their whole lives. They bought a house, but you know, there was something that they didn't know. And so when 08 happened, the stock market crashed, the housing market crashed, and we were disproportionately affected, right? So I use that example to say, if we had other information about alternative ways to invest and access, you know, and knowledge, so some of those people, they might've allocated their portfolio a little bit differently. Maybe they would've took some money out of their house bought some equity or as you as you are an advocate of bought some crypto you know what i mean and yeah and that way and the thing is when you invest you 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 make bets that are going to allow you to offset risk and offset losses right so if i if i know that you know crypto blood and i are going to you know buy a company right what we might what we might do so let's say we have 10 million dollars we might buy this company for five million and then what we do, we might make a passive investment into the equity so that we know that, hey, if this company goes, you know, sideways or doesn't make any money, we'll have income from these equities, right? You know, obviously that's the best case scenario. Or maybe we will, what we'll do is this company we, we're buying for $5 million, we might buy this other company that has steady cash flow so that if this doesn't work, we'll have that cash flow coming in to offset whatever losses we might incur over here. That's, but just, you know what, that, that's just that you, type of conversation we're having, right? I'll be honest with you. I wasn't talking like this when I was 18 or 20, yeah. but guess yeah. what? When I went to college, the kids that I went to college with, they were talking like that. Right. No, you even, made a, even you, if you they made a, uh... even if they weren't, in, let me finish real quick. Even if they weren't necessarily investing already, they had the ID and the knowledge that once I get some money, this is what I can do. Because yeah. you know, you see it around the dinner. Yo, I'll give you one last example. I had a classmate, right? Uh, we were talking. She was an un this was un this was like she was a junior. She raised over half a million dollars around the, the table at a family holiday dinner. And obviously, that that seems like an outlier, right? But that was normal on campus. So when you talk about that type of access and wealth and that type of information, there's always going to be advantage that's had. But the point for me is, it's not about us bridging that 500 year gap overnight, but it's about incremental progress because that's just how things work. Whatever happened in 500 years, you're not going to fix in one generation, or two or three or four generations. It's going to take time, but you have to start now. So we have to invest in these kids now, give them the tools and know that they're going to pass those tools on to their children. And so, you know, in a hundred years, things are going to look far different unless we, of course, blow up the planet and we're no longer here. But assuming that human history continues, they're going to be better off than we were in this moment. Yeah, I think the, the operative word there was cash flow at the beginning of your yes. of your thought process, mm -hmm. because I think a lot of people fail to realize real estate is great. Mm -hmm. Having a home is great. But if you mm -hmm. live in that home, mm -hmm. it's not ca it's not a cash. It's not a, a productive asset for you. Right. You're not making money off of living in your own home. It's really a lie. To me, it's a liability. You make money in, a, in, in uh, you know, with the uh, appreciation of that house over 20 years, 15, 20 years, 30 years now. But it's not a productive asset. You want to get yourself into owning businesses that have cash flow. Uh, you know, owning stocks yeah. that pay dividends. Yeah. That's where absolutely. the wealth is, is really built. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and I was look I was trying to look up, look up the statistics because I like, I like to be clear in what I'm saying and, and not just pull things out of the air, but you know, I, it's why I'm, um, I'm not big into home ownership. Mm -hmm. it, it's not a goal for me, right. for me, 
for me, the so, goal is to be, for me, the goal is to be nimble and flexible in what I do um, and keep a low overhead. The key to, the key to success financially for anyone um, uh, is to have low overhead, low cost and work your way because it takes time, work your way towards high income. But the key is not to make your cost increase alongside your income because then you defeat the purpose. And I think, again, I'm saying this now, I didn't know this or even think like this when I was 23, 24, right? I was just thinking about, hey, money's coming. It's, it, it's always going to be like this. But life will show you that it's not always like that. That doesn't mean that, you, that you're going to go broke, but it just means that you're going to have ebbs and flows. Like even now, you know, this is unexpected, this pandemic. It's affecting everyone, you know, it's affecting oh, yeah. our business. Um, you know, we went from, you know, we went from between 30 to 60,000 a month to 12,000 a month. Yeah. You do the math. That's a hell of a difference, right? Yeah. Um, I just spoke to, you know, I, I make a point to speak to small business owners uh, constantly because I'm one of them. And um, what I'm hearing isn't good. You know, there's one gentleman, um, he spent roughly uh, between two and $300,000 to open up a, a restaurant not too far from me here on, on the Upper West Side in Manhattan. And then the pandemic hit and guess what? No business. Yeah. Um, you know, my dry cleaner, um, good family, um, great guys, they closed, you know. Um, I know another gentleman, he owns two small restaurants right on the same strip. He's closing because he went from making $1,600 a day to making about $200 a day. Mm. You can't run a business that way. But again, so, so I say all that to say that there's always risk involved in whatever you do. Um, Absolutely. And, and, and I think if you live a life where you take no risk, you're, you're not necessarily going to get the reward, but you have to take intelligent risk, you know? Um, and sometimes things are beyond you, you know, even in insurance, they have these uh, catastrophic event clauses because they know that unexpected things happen. No one had expected this, you know, we're going on month three of quarantine. Um, you know, I don't care how much money you have. If you're not making any money for three months, you're going to be concerned. Yeah. Um, it doesn't now now if you're if you're wealthy, maybe your concern is less. But that's not true either because it depends on how you derive your wealth. The truth right. is that this shows that we're all connected, right? We're all connected. I mean, if if I'm making money in a cafe, guess what? I need you to have a job because if you don't have a job, you're not going to come into my cafe. I also need my manufacturers to make money because if they're not making money, I'm not going to be able to get the products I need to sell in my cafe. So we're all connected, right? And I think what this what this crisis has given us the ability to to do is is really speak to our students and and give them information and kind of explain to them why what's happening is happening, and then mm -hmm. give give them the, the the necessary tools to come out on the other side of this. Because listen, as bad as this is, I'm very positive. Because if I'm not, you know, I might as well jump out the window and, and get it on with, right? Because you, you have to believe that things are going to return to some semblance of normalcy. Mm -hmm. We don't know what that looks like, but let's assume we come back and we're able to do business and we're able to go to school and we're able to go to gyms and we're able to go to our jobs and into the office, you know, or, or, or rather assume, um, re sorry, resume some, some semblance of working. You know, businesses are going to have to kind of navigate their way through that because we don't know what it looks like. But at the end of the day, it's a better state than not having anything, right? So I always say, um, if you're thinking about, you know, whatever you're doing, education-wise, business-wise, you have to take risks. Um, and you have to know that, you know, oftentimes um, things are gonna work out, but there are gonna be times when you did everything quote unquote right, and then you get COVID, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, just being able to stay in the game and navigate your way through that is the key. And I th and you know, to bring it back, I think the key to being able to navigate any crisis is having some type of resources uh, and skill in combination, because that's going to be able to allow you to, to kind of thread water as things kind of get back to, you know, a normal condition. And, and you know, we're talking about COVID now, but that was the same during uh, the housing crash or after 9-11. Things were affected economically and people had to figure out how they were going to hang in there for a particular period of time before things got back to normal, right? And that's what we're seeing now. Yeah, you want to be, uh, you don't want to be one-dimensional, people. 
And uh, yeah, many times, <laughs> many times you find that to be the case when yep. we, we go for the sports yep. uh, or entertainment route, you know, mm -hmm. we, be, mm -hmm. we become one, one dimensional. So yeah. I think yeah. learning, and I'm glad you guys are doing this with the youth, getting yeah. them into the STEM, you know, mm -hmm. you got to know a, a, a number of things when you're talking about STEM. If you're getting into engineering, yeah. you're getting into math, yeah. you got to know a number of things. So uh, I'm, I'm glad you guys are doing that, especially in my city. So, yeah, uh, yeah man, where where can people find out about the foundation and even donate? Uh, they can donate at CAY2Foundation.org. Um, you know, they can find more information there. Uh, they can also reach out to me at any time. You know, our information, our contact information is on the website. Um, you know, if people are interested in coming in and, um, you know, speaking to our students, you know, we're always interested in having, um, you know, preferably STEM-focused individuals come and speak with us. Um, you know, if people can can reach out to, to um, our foundation um, also on Instagram, CAY2Foundation uh, on Instagram and on Facebook, same thing. And, you know, that's where we're available. You know, again, anyone um, interested in donating can go directly to our website, CAY2Foundation.org, and there's a donate link. And also, again, if you're interested in just um, de developing or delivering or, or, or donating any other resources, you know, we'll gladly accept those as well. And again, you can contact us on the same um, platforms, Instagram, CAY2Foundation, and on Facebook, CAY2Foundation, and then obviously our website, CAY2Foundation.org. Nice, man, Ro. Thanks. I'll yeah. leave a link to all that in the description, yeah, guys. Sure. Uh, appreciate yeah. you coming on and looking forward yeah. to uh, connecting with you when you come through, man, once this absolutely, whole COVID man. thing is and, over. And, absolutely. And, and you know what? I almost forgot the most important thing. And thank you for, for, for actually reminding me by saying when I get back to Detroit, we're going to have our first annual um, 5K fundraiser at Bell Isle on July 4th. Uh, we're right. going to be putting out some information on that as well, and I'll be providing that to you as well, um, Great. so you can disseminate it to your to your audience. Um, but that's coming on the July fourth. We're going to have voter registration out there. We're going to have, um, you know, we're going to have food out there. You know, hamburgers, hot dogs, um, all of the, uh, you know, condiments and all of that fun stuff. You know, we're really doing that to, to essentially bring attention to, you know, one of the reasons why this COVID situation has been hitting our community so hard is because of underlying health conditions and fitness and, and healthy living is a way to, you know, again, you can't prevent everything, but you can certainly um, put yourself in the best position to make it through this crisis. Right. Hey, I, I agree, man. Raul Weekly, yeah. Weekly, yes, uh, make sure you guys definitely check out what he's doing yeah. with the Coleman Young Educational Foundation. Like and subscribe, guys. And uh, if you like these types of interviews, I will bring them to you. Click that bell to receive more of them. And we out of here. How? Once you graduate to real estate.